Welcome to eExtension Gardening for Pollinators webinar. Uh, eExtension, or America's research-based learning network, gathers people from universities and the public together to learn and produce new educational and informational resources on a wide range of topics. This webinar is brought to you by the National Extension Master Gardener social media team, uh, which is a group of extension professionals and master gardeners from across the United States who engage the public in research-based gardening topics. Today's webinar topic is Gardening for Pollinators, so we're excited to have registrants from all um, over 28 states to attend this webinar. While many of the pollinators and pollinator plants may vary between all of your states, many basics of gardening for pollinators are the same, and supporting the diversity of pollinators is a national and international issue we can support together. So it won't be long until we can celebrate National Pollinator Week, June 17th through 24th. And in preparation for that, um, we'd like to um, help make you aware of the events going on um, and enable you to support gardeners, um, uh, help garden for po with pollinators every day. So I'm going to turn it over to um, our presenter. Um, her name is Denise Ellsworth, and she's the Program Director for Honeybee and Native Pollinator Education at the Department of Entomology at The Ohio State University. So today she's here to help us learn more about pollinators and what we can do to support them. So welcome, Denise, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, who's joined us virtually in this room. It's, uh, it's nice to imagine this room full of gardeners from all across the country with all of your different plants and all of your different pollinators, but coming together to see how we can collectively kind of create this patchwork of habitat and conservation for pollinators. I enjoyed seeing the list of plants that you entered when you registered for today's webinar and, you know, the diversity of, of environments that we garden. So a lot of your plants I can't grow, maybe some of my plants you can't grow, but it was really interesting to see the different bees and other pollinators that are attracted to all of our gardens. As Karen said, I am in the Department of Entomology here at Ohio State University, and I coordinate honeybee and native pollinator educational programs with OSU Extension. Before I came to the department, I was a county extension educator in Northeast Ohio for actually about 20 years. And my background is commercial and consumer horticulture. I coordinated the Master Gardener program, a lot of educational outreach for professionals and consumers in horticulture. So I really come uh, kind of at this topic as a plant person, but also with a real interest and love in particularly insects. Um, my background is plant pathology and environmental education. And I worked in the county with integrated pest management and um, helping gardeners be ecologically sound in their gardening practices. When I moved over about a year ago to the department, uh, one of the projects that I was really eager to begin on was developing some educational resources for master gardeners and county extension educators to be able to use to teach groups about pollination. So I got together with Regina Hirsch, who's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Jennifer Hopwood, who's with the Xerces Society. And um, they had great resources, great PowerPoints already put together with Xerces. And using their expertise, we came together and developed three educational modules, developed a, a course site that we'll talk about uh, towards the end of our webinar on e-extension. So all of the PowerPoint slides that you're going to see today are available to you to pull down and kind of adapt to your own audiences, as well as a lot of resources that we tried to gather all in one place. We received some uh, grant money from the Integrated Pest Management Working Group in the North Central region. And through that effort, we then developed these power pollinators materials. So that's just a little bit about who I am and how, how I got here. We were lucky, actually, that um, Xerces was just so generous about sharing their resources and their photography. So many of the slides that we're going to see come to us because of, pollen, uh, because of photographers who donated their work to uh, Xerces. So let's look at uh, kind of an overview of where we're going today. We're going to talk about who pollinators are, what they do, why we care, and how, what gardeners can do. And all of us can do something. We probably already are doing a lot to create habitat, to conserve pollinators. We're going to talk about some garden design elements that, uh, as Karen said, really cut across whatever region we're in that can help pollinators. And then we'll talk about those materials and how you can help us to spread the word 
about pollinators. For many of the slides, we're going to go fairly quickly just because I, I wish we had really a half-day workshop in person where we could see each other and interact with each other and really learn from each other's experience. Uh, but we only have about 50 minutes in a virtual room. So for some of the, the um, design elements, we'll go through them fairly quickly. So you've probably heard this before, that one in every three bites of food and drink that we take comes to us because of pollinators. And this is kind of an estimate. You know, scientists kind of sat down and, and put together this estimate of how much of our food can we thank pollinators for. Um, now, when you hear people talk about this, sometimes they'll say that honeybees or that it's bees, but really if you kind of trace this back, it seems to be more in line with all kinds of animal pollinators. So we're going to look at who some of those different animal pollinators are. But, um, but really we're going to start with that focus on why, why should people care about pollination? I mean, we all eat, uh, we drink coffee, some of that coffee depends on pollination. If you're um, a chocolate fan like I do, chocolate comes to us because of pollination, so many of the foods that really add richness and nutrition to our diet come to, come to us because of pollinators. So Cornell University did a study last year on the, the dollar value. You know, a lot of people want to know what's it worth to me, or if I'm going to give some research dollars to support pollinators, what's, what's the value of that? Put a dollar figure on that. So Cornell estimated that about $29 billion of pollination services come to us because of insect pollinators. So those are all the bees and flies and moths and butterflies that come together to, to pollinate crops. Those are directly pollinated crops, like alfalfa, apples, almonds, and berries that rely directly on a pollinator to transfer pollen from flower to flower. And then some of those crops that are indirectly dependent on pollinators. So they may self-pollinate themselves, like soybeans, but their yield is enhanced if they have insect pollinators. So 29 billion, and that's just North America. That's not looking uh, you know, globally at the value of pollinators. But more than just our agricultural inputs, pollinators are really key, and they're called as keystone species to the environment. And, and that's because about 85% of all flowering plants depend on insect pollinators to take that pollen from plant to plant. And without those, those insects, then, that key of providing food and that whole ecological benefit wouldn't happen. Now, a lot of plants are specific to the pollinators that they need, um, like this bottle gentian that needs a strong bee, like a bumblebee, to pry open those petals uh, to pollinate. But other plants, like this Virginia bluebell, are more generalist in their needs. So they depend on a lot of different wild pollinators that come and visit and transfer that pollen from flower to flower. So native plants need native pollinators. These are relationships that have developed over eons, and um, they're really key to the health of our environment. So in the act of transferring that pollen from flower to flower, that allows pollination to happen, right? That's just the, the pollen getting there to that receptive female organ on a flower of the same species. But then that pollen has to germinate on the female pistil and grow down into the ovary. And the male gamete has to meet the female gamete for that fertilization to happen. That enables seed production. That enables fruit production. And think about all the animals then that depend on those seeds, on that fruit, for part of their diet. So all the birds and mammals, large and small, that depend upon that work of pollinators in the environment. Also think about those millions of pollinators out there and how they themselves are food for somebody else. So those bees and those butterflies, somebody's having them for lunch, and so they're a real, a real key to keeping that food web rich. So let's talk about who the pollinators are. And probably for a lot of the groups that many of us work with who may not be as familiar about pollinators and the value of pollinators, they probably think of the honeybee first. So the honeybee down in the bottom right of your slide, you know, the, the kind of the icon of, of pollinators. But there are a lot of different animals that serve in that role as pollinators, from hummingbirds to other kinds of birds, small mammals, bats certainly, not in Ohio, we don't have pollinating bats, but in many of the places that you're all from, you may have bats that serve as pollinators. 
as well as insects. And across the globe, we have monkeys, we have lemurs, we have um, different kinds of lizards that serve as pollinators. So there's really a rich diversity of pollinators across the globe. Main group of pollinators are the insects. So whether we're talking about the flies or the wasps, beetles, moths, and butterflies, they're all serving that role of visiting flowers and transferring pollen from plant to plant. But the key pollinator, as we know, are the bees. And let's talk about a few of the reasons why bees are so important as pollinators. Bees are vegetarians, so they rely on pollen and nectar for their diet. They've adapted, um, they've evolved over time from wasps, wasps which have a, um, a carnivore diet. They're um, relying on insects and other uh, protein sources to provide that protein source for the larvae. But bees depend on pollen. They have to find pollen um, to, to rear their young and to provide those amino acids that are essential for the growth of the larvae. So bees have a diet of pollen and nectar. They're seeking out flowers for that food. Their bodies are also adapted for pollination. They have storage structures, many of them, on their legs. You've seen bees full of pollen, their basket, pollen baskets full of pollen. Um, some bees collect pollen on their abdomens and fly around. So they look, they're called, the, they look like flying Cheetos if they've been visiting flowers with orange pollen because they have so much of that collected on their abdomens. Other bees collect pollen underneath their, their arms, and so it looks like they have um, hairy armpits. So all these different structures on a bee's body that are modified for that pollen collection. And some bees actually ingest the pollen and then regurgitate that when they come back to provision their nest for their young. Bees' hairs are also adapted for pollination. Now, if we, these are uh, electron micrographs of a bee's hair, and you can see how those hairs are branched, and then those globules on the end are, are pollen. So pollen is attracted to those branched hairs. If we looked at a, the hair of a wasp, they don't have branched hair, so they, they tend not to collect that pollen. They're not collecting it on purpose, but even if they are transferring pollen from plant to plant, there's not a lot of, of pollen that's collecting onto a wasp body. Another piece of this element of why bees are so important is the behavior called flower constancy or flower fidelity. So this is the concept where bees, especially social bees, are visiting all members of one species of flower while they're collecting their pollen and nectar before moving on to another species. So from a plant's perspective, this makes them really successful as pollinators because they're going to visit all the sunflowers in your garden before moving on to, say, the zinnias or to the marigolds. And so that enables that, that flower, to, that plant, to have a better chance of being pollinated because the right pollen is being taken to the right flower. So as I said, a lot of, of gardeners or folks who maybe aren't as familiar with the diversity of pollinators think about honeybees as really being the key pollinator. And certainly they're important. Agriculturally, we depend on hives, on migratory hives, for a lot of the pollination that happens. Um, but recent studies have shown how important those wild pollinators are as well, and that working in concert, the honeybees and the wild pollinators are really completing the job of crop pollination and, and native plant pollination. So we're going to focus a bit on the three broad groups of native bees. And so when we talk later about these design elements and gardening elements for pollinators, it'll make sense with some of the, the lifestyles that we've talked about for these, these wild bees. So we'll talk about the bumblebees, which are our most obvious group of social native bees. Of course, honeybees are also uh, social bees, but they're not native to North America. They were brought over in the 1600s with early settlers. So we'll focus on bumblebees and as an example of the social bee. And we'll talk about ground nesting solitary bees as well as cavity nesting solitary bees. So let's start with bumblebees. And I know lots of you have seen bumblebees out in your garden this spring. I had an email from a friend of mine way back in, in March here in Ohio, which was pretty, pretty chilly. It was about a 42 degree day. 
And she sent me a picture of bumblebees out in her crocus flowers. So bumblebees are really amazing pollinators because they are able to generate their own heat by vibrating their thoracic wings, I mean, their thoracic muscles. They can actually kind of unhinge their wings from their muscles, and they vibrate those muscles to generate heat. So we often see bumblebees flying much earlier in the season than we see other bees just because they can generate their own heat. Now, the bees that my friend emailed me a picture of were queen bumblebees, and that's because the queen is the only bumblebee that survives the winter. So bumblebees are something, if we make a comparison to the gardening world, bumblebees are like annuals and honeybees are like perennials, where the honeybee colony survives from year to year. That queen may live for several years, at least the beekeeper hopes so. And even though a lot of those workers are dying in six weeks or maybe less, that colony is surviving from year to year. Whereas a honeybee colony is an annual event. It's only the queen that survives the winter, and she has to create that nest and, uh, and lay eggs for her offspring to make it through that year. Then that queen dies, and it's a new fertilized queen who survives next winter. So let's spend just a second on this outline that looks at the life cycle of a queen honeybee. Or excuse me, of a queen uh, bumblebee. So the bumblebee queen comes out in spring, and she's looking for some kind of, of cavity or hole to nest in. Now, some bumblebees will nest on the surface. Um, they'll kind of gather grasses and, or fine grassy areas to make their nest. But they also use abandoned mouse holes often. So the queen bumblebee is out on a cool day in, in early spring. She's looking for a new place to create her nest. And then she's starting to, lay these, to create these waxy cups with her body. She goes out and she gathers pollen and nectar to start to provision those cups. And when she's gathered pollen and nectar, she starts then to lay eggs, which will develop into, they'll hatch into the larvae. The larvae will then pupate and emerge as adults. And those adults, her daughters, will be her workers. So the queen then stays in underground for most of the season. We don't really see her out much after that. Her job is really to lay eggs. And the workers then are out collecting pollen and nectar, bringing it back to that nest to uh, provision those cells for the next generation of eggs that that queen will lay. So the bumblebees that I'm seeing right now in my garden in Ohio are smaller than the queens that I saw about six weeks ago. So those are the workers. It's not that they're necessarily a different species, um, but they're smaller. They have less food. Um, they're, they're not the fertile queen. So then later in the season, the drones, the males, are produced, and new virgin queens, they leave the nest, they mate, the drones die, all the workers die, the old queen dies, and the only bumblebee to survive next winter, then the only bumblebees, are the fertilized queens that find maybe a, a cavity in the ground, a secluded place to survive the winter. I have, incidentally, a couple of props that I use when I teach about bees and gardening for pollinators. And one of them is a, a bumblebee puppet, which you can get at you know, Amazon or some other um, puppet supplier. But it's really nice to be able to, to help groups understand the fuzziness of bumblebees. And uh, you know, as you're being maybe a little theatrical talking about the life cycle, of that bumblebee. So one of the reasons that bumblebees are such good pollinators is because of that ability to generate their own heat. So because they can fly when other bees can't leave the, the nest or the, the colony, they can pollinate during very cold temperatures or even rainy times. You'll see bumblebees flying at very, light, very low light levels as well. In fact, they're often used in greenhouses or high tunnels because they're not kind of disoriented by light like honeybees can be in those enclosed spaces. So they have all these adaptations that make them awesome pollinators. And another adaptation is that they can buzz pollinate. So you've heard this in your garden. You've seen a big bumblebee, and you've seen her buzz in the flower. And my prop for this is actually a tuning fork. So I have a tuning fork that's about a middle C. And that's the tone that she makes when she vibrates those muscles. She um, unhinges her wings. She makes that, um, that buzzing motion with her body when she's in this blueberry flower, for example. 
And that buzz, that tone, that middle C, causes the anther to shed its pollen all over her fuzzy body. Then she moves on to the next flower. She takes pollen with her. And hence, we have pollination of those blueberries and cranberries and other crops that benefit from that buzz pollination. Now, bumblebees aren't the only bee that can buzz pollinate. In fact, carpenter bees can buzz pollinate. But some crops depend on that buzz pollination for really efficient pollination. So let me take you to my garden a couple years ago. Um, this was actually in, a, in my kitchen garden in my backyard. And I had a clay pot that was um, left upside down in the garden just really by accident. I didn't get to my fall cleanup. And I went out there in the spring, and my dog, Ringo, who's a golden retriever, very curious and communicative, he was telling me something's going on with this clay pot. So I came over, and I, I turned the clay pot over. And I think you can see that mass of grass that was gathered in the, on the ground in the bottom of that clay pot. And so then we could see there was a queen bumblebee who was going in and out of the hole in that clay pot. And she just thought she really hit the jackpot, right? This was the best mouse burrow she'd ever seen. It had smooth sides. It only had one opening to guard. It didn't have any rain. She was just in heaven in there. And then she started to gather some bits of grass from my yard and bring those back inside that clay pot to begin her nest. Well, there's Ringo. And the idea of Ringo, my kitchen garden, and a bunch of worker bumblebees just wasn't going wasn't gonna to happen. So I had to try to relocate the, the bumblebee nest. Uh, unfortunately, bumblebees are kind of notorious for being difficult to relocate. There is actually a national project that's trying to track bumblebee hives or bumblebee nests. So if you have some bumblebees who are nesting in your garden, you can actually log into the site and tell them where, where the bumblebees are nesting. So we had to relocate this nest um, to, to protect Ringo. OK, so let's move on to some solitary bees. So when I teach groups, and you've probably had this happen too, you talk with, with folks who, again, aren't as familiar about bees or they're scared of bees, and you're talking about ground nesting bees, you can imagine what they think of first. They think of yellow jackets. They think of being repeatedly stung or the, you know, the farmer who ran over a nest and was repeatedly stung. But solitary bees are completely def different than um, those social wasps. Solitary bees don't have young to defend. They don't make honey. And so they are not aggressive bees. They are extremely unlikely to sting. And unless you actually pick up and hold one of these solitary bees in your hand, she's very unlikely to sting you. And she, she has no way to gather other bees to attack you. She's a solitary bee. She's not a social bee. So we'll look at a couple different examples of some solitary bees. And we'll walk through this life cycle first. So in the top center, we have uh, a bee. You can see all that pollen uh, on, on her legs. And I didn't mention, but it, it's important to know that only the females are adapted to carry pollen, because the females are doing this work of, of provisioning nests and bringing food back to the young. And that's true for all kinds of bees. So we have the adults here who may emerge in spring. This is a mining bee, for example. She has a, a cavity underground that she provisions with pollen and nectar. And you know that pollen and nectar, together with some of her enzymes from her saliva, make this substance called bee bread. This is what the larvae feed upon. So she's going to gather this bee bread, bring it back to that underground cavity. She's going to lay her egg. And then in the bottom picture, you can just see that little larva that's sitting on the top of the bee bread, eating the nourishment. And this is a solitary bee, so that adult female, the mom, never comes back, never, provision, never uh, cares for that young once it's hatched out. She does all her work at the beginning by provisioning those cells. And the larvae grows. It eventually pupates. And that cycle, that entire life cycle, may take up to a year. And so we don't see those adult bees again for another year. Uh, one of the props that I use when I'm teaching about this is a cluster of plastic grapes. Because it gives people kind of a visual of what may be underground that we're not seeing when we do just see the hole, the exit hole, of those solitary ground nesting bees. But what actually is 
underground could be this very complex structure, all these, all these cells and uh, tunnels that lead back to all these places where bees eggs have been laid and, and the bee bread has been provisioned for the offspring. And actually, some of these cells can be several feet deep and several feet wide. So it's really this awesome network that's happening underground. So now I'm going to take you to a botanical garden here in Ohio that I was visiting last spring. And um, if you're from the Midwest, you know we had a very fast spring last year. and We had very warm temperatures. But um, what you can see from this image are, do you see all the little mounds of soil, which at first glance look like anthills? Um, this was under an oak tree. And you can see how early in the spring this was by the the lack of shade there, right? There aren't leaves. They're just kind of those shade from the branches there. So very early in the spring, and all these mounds of soil. And so as we get closer, look in the middle of that mound of soil, and we can see that bee just poking her head out of that mound. What I could also see kind of flying all over this area under this oak tree were bees, adult bees, about um, actually hundreds of them flying around about 10 inches above the ground under this tree around all these mounds. Okay, so they're, um, they're flying together. They're mating. They're flying off. They're coming back. They're mating. They're going in and out of the holes. And they're totally not aggressive. I'm standing there. I mean, you can see how close I must have been with my camera. I'm right there above one of those exit holes. And there's just no, um, I'm not even observed. In fact, they're kind of leaning down into their hole when my shadow casts over the opening because they're trying to stay away from me. There was also a little boy beside me who was about um, two or three with his mom. And I said, oh, look, look at all the bees. And it's OK. You know, they're not dangerous bees. And they're, they're not going to hurt you. And uh, we talked about the baby bees who are going to be developing underground. This is what was in bloom for us at that time. It was early in the spring. So we had star magnolias and some early rhododendrons in bloom at that arboretum. And so this adult female bee was off gathering pollen and nectar, bringing that back um, to those underground cells. And it could take her a whole day, especially if the weather, um, the weather has to be favorable, so a whole day for her to collect enough pollen and nectar to provision just one of those little individual cells underground and then lay her egg. And then tomorrow, if the weather's bad, she just hangs out there underground, waiting for the next warm day when she can go off and gather more pollen and nectar, making more bee bread, and then laying another egg. So that by the time she's through her lifespan as an adult above ground, she has maybe provisioned 10 or 12 of those cells underground. Then we see nothing all spring and summer. Those bees stay underground. They're going through different larval instars. They're pupating. And then next spring, around the same time, they're emerging as adults to mate. They're going to reuse those same cavities, those same cells underground as the places that they emerged. Okay, so that's an overview of our ground nesting solitary bees. And here is an up close of some of those little those those holes, those anthill-like uh, mounds that this bee produces, and then a cutaway of some of those chambers underground that she uh, then has provisioned. Some of these bees, incidentally, can line those cells with a, a polyester-like secretion that keeps those cells waterproof. So even if the, the soil floods, that uh, bee is safe uh, underground. And the soil, for a lot of these sites, is going to be south-facing, tends to be very well-drained, and very sunny in spring. Yeah, someone commented, I saw in the chat, that those chambers are pretty deep. And they actually can be quite deep. Some, some species can have chambers that are three feet down and six feet wide. So it's this whole amazing network that we can't even see. Uh, next, we're going to talk about cavity nesting solitary bees. So you've probably seen this leaf symptom in your garden. And to me, this isn't, I wouldn't call this damage. This is, to me, this is cool evidence that I have native bees in my garden. This is on my epimedium. And these are uh, leaf cutter bee, little, little cuttings out of leaves that the leaf cutter bee has done. So we'll talk about her life cycle. 
Uh, Denise, there's a question in the chat box about, um, if I may ask real quick, quick, what happens if the tunnel closes on the bees? Well, they actually can plug up those holes and, um, I mean, so I don't know if you mean closes on the adult bee or closes on the, the larvae, but once that cell is provisioned, it really doesn't need any care. And different species of these bees may actually plug up that hole and, and then that when that adult emerges next year, she has to dig, or he has to dig his way out of that tunnel. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. So the leafcutter bee is one of those bees that gathers pollen on her abdomen. And you can see that there. Um, she's got that orange um, abdomen where she's gathered that pollen. So the same kind of life cycle as that ground nesting bee. She's provisioning the cells laying the eggs, and kind of doing all the work up front. She never sees her offspring, um, never comes back to care for them. She does all the work at the beginning by getting the cells ready and gathering that bee breath. So and there are a lot of different species and a lot of different timing for many of these um, solitary bees. So there's a whole art to the phenology of solitary bees, when different species will emerge, what they're feeding on, when they're coming out. So you'll, also see them, the leafcutter bees will come to different plants in your garden. But they tend to be those soft leaves like roses or iteas. I mean, it depends what grows for you. I have hostas and epimedium um, ash leaves that have these like hole punched areas out of them where she has uh, first visited the, the leaf, gathered, she actually chews that piece out with her jaws. And then, here I'll show you the slide, she actually cuts that element out, and, um, and then she rolls that up and takes that back to the cavity where she's going to provision the cell. Okay, so these are actually the linings for those cells. So she gathers that chunk of leaf up in her, in her leg. She flies back to um, a cavity or a twig. This could be the twig of, a in our area, an elderberry or a sumac, some other kind of shrub with a, a pithy or a soft um, center with a soft tip. So she can't really drill out the, the twig. She's making use of a twig that already has a soft inside. She pulls that piece of leaf disc down inside. She may actually need 12 or more of those discs to make the kind of lining that she likes, nice soft pillow, nice soft walls for the, the developing larvae. And she's off to do the bee bread thing, right? Gathering pollen and nectar from the plants that are blooming in our garden, bringing that watery mixture back down into that twig, leaving that in the cell when she has enough. Again, it could take her a whole day to gather enough bee bread for one offspring. Then she lays her egg. She may cap that cell with more discs of leaf. And then um, the next day, she's off to do the same task again. So that, again, by the time she's done, she may have, um, here's an elderberry, just for an example, of the kind of twig that she may um, lay her, her eggs in. And by the time she's done, she may have lined up about 10 or 12 provisioned cells in that twig. And now, she can't break that twig off. So some gardeners think, I don't, I don't want these bees around. I don't want the leaf discs out of my leaves. I don't want them you know, damaging my twig. But she's actually just taking advantage of a cut branch, a pruned branch. She can't actually break the branch off um, to dig into that twig. And then here we see um, an example of one of those cavity nesting bees in the, with the twig cut away, where we can see those different cells um, lined up in that twig provisioned with the pollen and nectar. They will also nest in existing cavities in dead trees. Sometimes these are beetle burrows. They'll pull, again, those, pull those leaf discs in, pull that bee bread in, and lay an egg in there. Denise, if you have a second, there were two questions that came up. Um, one was a question about what's the ratio of male to female bees in terms of hatching. And I think that question was asked just as we were closing down on the ground bees. OK. And um, I'll let you answer that, and then um, we have another question, too. OK. And I have to say, I'm not really sure what the proportion of male to female is for those solitary bees. But I know for the leafcutter bees that the males tend to be laid in the ends of those twigs, so they're the last eggs to go in. Because male bees, well, let me back up, B 
bees can decide whether their offspring are going to be male or female. They can decide whether the egg is fertilized to be a female or not to be a male. And so the, the males are often laid last in the twig because they have a shorter development period and they can emerge first and then wait there for um, their sisters. Yes, they do mate with their sisters. Thank you. Um, I think the other question was related to how do you, is there a page to know um, the difference between large and small bees? Is there a place that, maybe a place to identify the difference between these bees? Oh, sure. And actually, when we get to the piece about the e-extension site that has our materials, we've gathered a lot of resources from across uh, lots of websites, a lot of PDF documents that can help you wherever you are in the country. Uh, we have, for example, in Ohio, this great bee ID guide. And there are some for other states as well. So we've tried to pull those together uh, for folks to access. Wonderful. Thanks. We Again, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I don't see any other. Um, I guess there's one other question. It says, how effective are native pollinator boxes if they are set out at the correct time of year, considering there is ample nectar and pollen around? So uh, I'm guessing that the question about, is about those nesting boxes that provide habitat for leafcutter bees and mason bees, for example, to, to bring in their provisions and create for the young. And so yeah, they are very successful. And we'll talk about that um, here in a bit as a, a way that we can encourage native pollinators by using those nesting boxes. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we can, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but um, we can get going, and I'll keep my eye on the chat and record the questions as we go. OK, super. So let's turn our attention now to some of the things that we can do as gardeners that help pollinators. And probably you're doing a lot of these things already, so congratulations. Um, maybe you've seen the leaf cutter bee circles out of your leaves. I actually read something not long ago where someone recommended a kind of insecticide to stop leaf cutter bees. And I thought, wow, really? Like if a robin was gathering leaves and twigs out of your garden, would you try to kill that mother? She's you know, provisioning, um, creating this nest for her young. So I think we need to kind of expand our grace to um, some of these bees as well, especially when we understand that they really are not harmful to us and you know, a few leaves that are damaged, um, not a big deal. So let's talk about some of those ideas. Um, and we're going to start with three main concepts. So the first concept is to recognize what habitat you already have, which plants pollinators are already visiting in your garden, and uh, which pollinators you know, you're seeing often, which ones you're not seeing as often. So just observing what's already going on. And I saw from the varied input when you registered for the program that many of you are observing. You're looking at which plants pollinators like. You know pollinators. Some of you have demonstration gardens that relate to pollinators, which I think is, is just awesome. The first step is really teaching people to look at what they already have, which plants are already successfully attracting pollinators, and which pollinators are they. Then we can look at how do we adapt our management practices to favor pollinators. And we'll talk about a lot of different examples for this. And then finally, how can we enhance, restore, or create habitat? And so I'm not saying that everyone should have a bee garden or a butterfly garden. I mean, it would be great if you did, but not every gardener is ready to add on a new garden. And so what can we do in our gardens that we already have that will enhance the habitat for pollinators? So the first thing is to think like a bee. Think about the, the kinds of qualities that a bee wants in flowers, uh, what's attracting the bee, and often that's the, the color of the flower, the whites, the yellows, the blues tend to draw the pollinators in. Uh, the scent of that flower is often attractive for the bees. And then the, the protein from the pollen and the nectar reward. Of course, we don't necessarily know is this a high protein content flower or not, but we can say this is a flower that I see a lot of bees on. So there must be something attractive here and some reward for those pollinators. How about season-long sources of pollen and nectar? So wherever you live, in the country, there's going to be some variation throughout the year of those resources available for bees. So for us here in Ohio, we're really thinking about what an early season pollen and nectar source so that we're helping those honeybees that made it through the winter, or those first bumblebee queens that emerged. We're helping to provide a pollen and nectar source for those early arrivals. 
the next time is kind of middle of the summer when maybe there's not as much blooming. What can we add in that provides a good resource for pollinators? And then finally, those late season sources. What can we add that will be a good nectar source to help the bees to be really healthy and well fed to get them through the winter? So think about that year-round bloom. And how can you, you know, I encourage people when I talk about this is take a picture with your, with your cell phone. A lot of people aren't into garden journaling or they don't want to take detailed records. Well, you probably have a, a camera on your cell phone. So take a picture of your garden every week throughout the summer and, or throughout the year. And then when it's cold in February, it is here in Ohio, look at those images and see where your gaps are and where can you add in some plants. This is a demonstration garden, a master gardener garden in Door County, Wisconsin, this beautiful garden, and all the different flowers that they have. So think about at least three species of flowers in bloom in spring, summer, and fall. So I know for a master gardener, this is like no challenge at all. But for you know, a garden club that you're teaching or some new gardeners that you're working with, this, this may be something you know, that they may have to think creatively. What blooms in the spring, in the summer, and what do I plant in the fall? Use masses of color to attract pollinators because, as I said, it's the color, it's the scent of that flower that's going to draw the pollinators there. And you can do this even in small gardens. You know, you mass your bee balm together. You mass your purple sunflower together. Because of that quality of flower constancy or flower fidelity, the bees are going to tend to want to work all those flowers of the same species at one time. So instead of having you know, one of your purple cone flowers in the front yard and one in the backyard and one in the side yard, you have them grouped together, and that helps the bee be more efficient as she's foraging. A diversity of flower shapes is going to attract a lot of different kinds of pollinators. So, you know, those daisy-shaped flowers with the landing pad for butterflies. They have shallow flowers for some of those pollinators with shallow tongues. So uh, just a diversity of different flower shapes, which Gosh, isn't that what gardeners like anyway? Think from a bee's eye perspective. How can you create corridors to create some safe areas for pollinators to travel through your garden? Whether those are butterflies or birds or bees, can you link some of your garden patches together to create more habitat? Put your habitat right in the garden or close to the garden. I know somebody, when they registered, said she's from a community garden and wanted to know about pollinators there. Why not have a row of flowers, like this garden at the Cornell Plantation in Ithaca, where they have vegetables and fruits in this great demonstration garden, and they have the pollinating plants right there in the garden. The sunflowers, the zinnias, the purple cone flowers are right there in the garden. Focus on floral abundance and diversity. So the top right image, I won't go through all three of them, but the top right image is, is from the City Hall in downtown Chicago. Five stories up in the air, they have a green roof with all native plants, lots of things blooming. They keep bees on the roof. They have lots of, of birds and other pollinators that visit that site. And what you would think would be uh, a real urban desert. Use locally native plants to support more abundance and species-rich bee communities. So I'm not saying that you should plant only natives, but certainly we could all stand to plant a few more natives in our gardens. And there are so many garden-worthy natives. They, those will invite those native pollinators in. They have that special relationship. Those special dietary needs of the bee are met by that special flower that some of our um, non-native plants can't offer. Plant more than just cultivars and hybrids. So if you grow pink poodle, purple coneflower, you may not see any bees or butterflies visiting because it's so complex. It's kind of lost some of its attractiveness to bees and butterflies. Maybe a plant has last, lost its scent or it's lost um, the color attractant or the UV lines that really drew the pollinators in. So yeah, go ahead and plant those cultivars and hybrids, but mix those in with some of the straight species. Be a bee observer, so be out there looking when you're in your garden or you're visiting other gardens, demonstration gardens or public gardens, which plants are magnets for pollinators and can you incorporate those into your garden. Here's an example of a black-eyed Susan. This is a gold storm cultivar that 
hardly a pollinator is seen on that plant. So you may have to look at a different species or a different cultivar, uh, straight species, to get something that's attractive. As opposed to something like a milkweed, which is a great ne nectar source, host plant for monarchs is going to be uh, real inviting in your garden. There are so many different plants that can be incorporated in the garden, and because we're from all across the country, I'm not really going to talk about those, but I will point at the end to some of those plant lists. There's actually an app, too, for your phone called Be Smart, and you can put that on your phone, take it with you to the garden center, and for your region, it helps you select plants that are good for pollinators. So here in the Midwest, you know, we're looking at things like shrub dogwoods and elderberries, uh, viburnums and willows. Um, you'll have your own list of plants that are suitable in your environment. There are so many herbaceous plants, uh, some native and some not, that are excellent for pollinators. The, the non-natives tend to be the herbs. Think about the lavender and mints and basil in your garden. Those are really inviting as nectar sources. Host plants for butterflies and moths. And so you can find specific butterflies, plant those specific host plants. Here's the monarch, you know, who loves the milkweed or as both the adult source and the larval source. How about adding water into the garden and some protection from wind? I have just a shallow dish. You know, this doesn't have to be something complicated, uh, an expensive water garden. I have a shallow dish that I, every year or two, I get one at Goodwill for a couple bucks, and I put it out in the garden, and I keep it full of uh, a branch that goes across the middle, a landing spot for the insects, and then an inch or so of water. So I had all kinds of, of bees and wasps this weekend out there um, drinking out of my water dish. Limit your pesticide use. We talked about bees and these fuzzy bodies, these branched hairs. They also have static charges that help pollen stick to the bee's body. Well, that also helps, especially dust pesticides, stick to the bee's body. So really think about the kinds of pesticides that you're using and why, and whether that's a good fit for your interest in conserving pollinators. So some of the things to keep in mind, what time of day are you applying a pesticide? The label's going to tell you how toxic it is to bees, and some will say, you know, this product, once it dries, isn't to toxic, so maybe you apply that late at night. Um, a lot of night spraying is going on to conserve pollinators. It could be the formulation, as I mentioned, the dust that tend to be more toxic. And how about the inert ingredients or the use of fungicides and herbicides? Um, those can also have effects on bees. Um, just because it's not an, herb, not an insecticide doesn't mean it's not toxic. We're finding that many of these chemicals kind of join together and affect a bee's immune system. Tolerate some plant damage, if you call it that, but you tolerate some activity from these pollinators in your garden. Uh, and tolerate some weeds. Dandelions are an excellent pollen and nectar source at a time when bees need that pollen and nectar to build a colony or to provision their cells for offspring. So a tolerance for dandelions and for mustards or whatever blooms in your region that's considered a weed but might be an okay pollen or nectar source. A lot of these practices will help draw in the beneficial insects, so that helps us with pest management as well. Many of our beneficial predatory insects need a nectar um, meal before they lay their eggs to help manage other pests in the garden. So if we've drawn them in, we provide the food, we provide some water, we're more likely to have beneficials helping with our pest management needs. Develop nest habitat for those ground nesting bees. So let some floral be bare. If you know you have ground nesting bees, can you conserve that area? Don't kill, don't use a lot of mulch, don't use plastic mulch. Um, allow those bees to complete their life cycle there. For bumblebees, create some habitat. Put some you know, upside down clay pots. So sometimes those, there are some purchased, um, available for purchase bumblebee nesting boxes that you can try. They're not supposed to be very effective. But you can also have some areas that are not mown. Um, use some bunch grasses and leave that habitat. Um, those are likely places for bumblebees to select for their nest. 
recognize that wood, the habitat for wood nesting bees. Leave that dead tree. Um, uh, create a, a shrub, uh, a twig pile if you haven't created one already. And, and let that um, habitat be there for those, those cavity nesting bees. Or make one of your own little tunnel nests, and there are lots of, of uh, plans online. I'll show you where to find those. Or making your own tunnel nest out of cut elderberry twigs or bamboo twigs, cut and put inside, for example, a, a coffee can with one end still in, and then mount it in your garden as a place for bees to come and nest. Where you can purchase tunnel nests, um, just like bluebirds. Now, if you are a birder and you like nesting boxes, you know that you can't just put a nesting box out and leave it. It needs some care. You have to clean out that box. And the same thing goes for bees and these tunnel nests. You can't just put them out and leave them um, indefinitely because diseases can build up. It's kind of like all of us, all 200 and some of us living on that carnival, well, sorry, living on that cruise for however long, um, disease tends to build up. And so the same thing can happen in these nesting boxes. Some places to go to learn more. Um, I mentioned Xerces Society, which has great resources, PDFs, identification guides. Uh, Pollinator Partnership does the same. Uh, I'm at the Bee Lab, blab.osu.edu, here at OSU. And these were the partners who put together the, uh, many of the slides that you just saw. And so, Karen, we're um, about the time to spend just a quick minute on campus.extension.org. Yes. Um, do you want me to go ahead, or do you want to take a quick question? It looks like, you know, there were a couple of, of comments, but I think it'd be great. I know people want to find these resources. So let's go ahead with that, and um, we'll, we'll address any questions afterwards. OK, super. Mm -hmm. So I want you to leave with some resources so that you can help spread the word. Maybe you're already teaching folks about pollinators. Um, you'd like to have these slides sets available. You'd like to be able, I've had people who make slides into posters and use those for displays for the fair, what have you. So these are, are widely available. They're readily available PowerPoint programs that you can download. You can uh, adapt to your own needs. So let me tell you how to access them. So you're going to go to campus.extension.org. And we have three different PowerPoint modules available. It's called the Power of Pollinators is our site once you're there to uh, campus.extension.org. So we have why pollinators matter. We have bee biology and identification that help teach it, helps to teach uh, the difference between some native bees. And then we have the gardening for pollinators module. So when you go to our, our course website, you will see the PowerPoint is embedded right there in the course. You can also download it as a PDF or as a PowerPoint file. Um, if you click on the little gear icon, you'll get a drop-down box that you can open the speaker notes. You can print or download as a PowerPoint or a PDF. But you can also just download directly that PowerPoint file. But some folks don't have PowerPoint, so that you have a couple options there. You save it on your own computer. And then it's going to be available to you along with notes for each slide. We don't have a script, and so don't take it as a script. It's really meant to tell you about the content and about the slide, but not to read off and, you know, for an audience. So really adapt it to your own needs, your own plans. But we do have the notes built into that. You can create your own slides to kind of customize, take some slides in, put some slides out. And then we also have these links and resources. So someone was asking about the identification links if you go here under the bee biology module, we have all these different links which you can click on. And we either have the website linked or we have the actual PDF linked right there. And so we try to keep this really current. This is just something I heard about this week, the Encyclopedia of Life set of bee cards, which are beautiful and awesome. And I'm going to use some and print out for a museum interpretation that we have here on campus. And I've put that link then on this website. Um, you can also give us your feedback. So if you see some things that maybe need, need adjusting, we've identified something incorrectly, or you have some comments, you can offer your feedback.
And then finally, I just want to remind you that it is National Pollinator Week, June, the week of June 17th. And you can go to the Pollinator Partnership website to list your event. Um, they're trying to gather a nationwide listing of all these great things happening for pollinators. Thank you, Denise. Um, I know those the resources look like fun to be able to take the PowerPoints and um, share them with other gardeners to, to promote National Pollinator Week. So um, I, I put a chat pod link up in the chat pod. It's the bottom. It's the blog post um, where we tried to capture all the resources um, for this, this webinar. So you can take a look and access them um, in that blog post. Hey, and to that, um, at mybelab.osu.edu, I, I also have a uh, handout of today's PowerPoint. So if you want to print that out or just save it on your computer, you can look at that, as well as I'll, I'll post the, uh, the link to the recorded webinar as well. And I also have instructions for, you know, she said go to campus.extension.org, then what do I do? I have a PDF instruction sheet at blab.osu.edu that tells you exactly how to access these materials. Yes, I think that will be great. And we can, um, Denise, if you want to put the URL in the chat pod, um, that might be helpful for people too. So um, there's a number of ways you can get to all these resources. Um, one of them um, was the learn.extension.org site, and that has the webinar link. The recording will be there. Um, and it also has a link to the blog post with these resources. Or you can go to um, Denise's B Lab site, and she'll have some of these resources posted. So. You'll, you'll get to them from either, you can get to them from many directions. Um, thank you so much, Denise. Um, we're at one hour now, and um, it was just a great, you inspired a great discussion in the chat pod today. We had a diversity of comments from across the United States, and I think we're all looking forward um, to probably supporting pollinators and talking about them um, on National Pollinator Week here coming up in a few weeks on the 17th. So. Thank you so much, too, to, to you for setting this up and for, for monitoring as we go. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to do it. So, well, I know I will be viewing the recording again because um, there was such great information. So um, we'll look forward to uh, wrapping up the, the webinar, and I'll put um, the link in the chat pod. And, and, Denise, maybe we can also put your B-Lab site right in the webinar listing um, so they can get there from there. And um, the recording will be at that link. When it's ready, there will be a green playback button. So um, hopefully sometime by Friday and no later than Monday, you should be able to access the recording. So thanks to everybody um, that's attended. And I think that will be a wrap for today.